Hi, thanks for joining. Please make sure you subscribe to follow us on all the various platforms here on the podcast, as well as on YouTube, the stuff we write on Substack, as well as quick takes on Instagram and on threads. If you're enjoying what we're putting out there, please make sure you're sharing with all your friends and family. And if you have questions or comments about the stuff we're putting out there, please make sure you leave them in comments to us. We'll be more than happy to cover them in future talks. So the discussion today is going to uh, look at a couple of questions that got brought up as it relates to how we go about learning. Why is it that some people will say, oh, I'm a kinesthetic learner. I learn by, by moving around. I'm a visual learner. I'm an auditory learner. What does it mean to be a different type of learner and how do we actually learn? What actually takes place within the brain that allows us to learn? What takes place between the neurons within the brain that allows us to remember? How is it that some people are better at learning while other people are worse at learning? Or is there actually a difference that takes place? Let's go ahead and let's talk about how we go about learning and why it's not quite correct to say that. We have distinct types of learning in terms of the style by which we learn the best. So learning and the brain. Let's talk about that. Warning. The following presentation contains information that might contradict what you have previously heard or believed to be true about how the human body works and contains material that is not suitable for closed-minded individuals. Enjoy. The first thing we have to acknowledge when we start talking about learning is that the process of learning is a complex interaction of behaviors, a complex interactions of uh, exchanges that take place between the neurons within the brain that lead to the ability to form pathways. And it's those pathways that allow us to actually learn, to actually remember. And so we start looking at the concept and the ideas of learning. What we're really talking about is is we're talking about laying down and refining pathways within the brain that allow for the neurons to communicate with each other. And based off of the strength of those connections and the way in which those connections are laid out, leads to better recall or worse recall of the information that takes place. In this, we're gonna take a, take a look at a couple of kind of myths and misconceptions about learning in terms of, well, I am a kinesthetic learner or I am a visual learner or I'm an auditory learner in terms of the learning process. And then we'll also take a look at the concept or the idea that I have bad recall. I'm a test, I'm a bad test performer in terms of my ability to learn, my ability to recall, or it takes me a long time to learn something, or young brains are better than old brains in terms of the learning processes. And to address all of these in one talk seems to be kind of daunting, but the thing is that it's not really that daunting because all of the ideas that just got laid out in terms of these kind of concepts about learning all comes down to the concept of, or the idea about how neurons actually work because the learning process that takes place is based off of how neurons within the brain are interacting with each other in such a way that they're able to send signals. And based off those sending of signals, we're able to either learn a new behavior or remember something so that we can go about executing something at a later point in time. This all is about wiring. And so when we start talking about old brains and young brains and, plas and how plastic or how pliable the brains happen to be for younger children in their learning process versus older adults in the learning process and older adults are going to have to learn different than younger children. That's kind of bumpkiss if you actually look at what's taking place within the neurons. It's a little bit more difficult to do some of the wiring aspects when we start looking at the older brain relative to the younger brain because it's looking at are we trying to rewire a house or are we laying down the initial wiring? And so it's all about elect it's all about electrical signals. It's all about electrical passages that's going through the brain, that's going through the body in terms of how we go about moving things and learning things. And the idea that younger individuals have greater abilities to learn things relative to older individuals. To a certain extent, that's true. To a certain extent, yes, older individuals may have a more difficult time learning new things than younger individuals do, but that doesn't mean they can't learn the new things. It's about trying to figure out how to pair the newer thing with something that has already been learned. And it goes back to the, to the analogy that I just talked about in terms of the wiring. For the younger brain, for the younger individual learning something, there is no wiring schematic yet. They're, they're laying down 
the way in which the electrical wires within their body are being laid out so that they're able to function correctly. Whereas with the older person, those wiring routes have already been laid down based off of all the things they've been doing. And so for the older individual, what they have to do is they have to learn how to reroute the wires, how to rearrange the electrical outputs to redo the circuit breakers so that the newer things are able to link with the older things so that they're able to do the newer things. As opposed for the younger individual, they're able to not have to do that secondary step. They're, all they're doing is simply just wiring. And just wiring is a lot easier than having to rewire. And so that's the idea when we start talking about, oh, the older person has a harder time learning than the younger person. When we're dealing with this, when we're looking at this in terms of the science, in terms of the neuroscience, in terms of the neuroanatomical, neurophysiological responses, the complexity of learning neurologically and neuro neuroanatomically is based off of the exposure to repeated stimuluses over time that's going to increase the interconnectedness between neurons. That changing of the connections, the changes, changes of the interconnectedness between neurons is sometimes referred to as neuroplasticity. And the neuroplasticity is how are the synapses, how are those connections between the neurons able to change based off the use and the disuse of those connections? The increasing development that takes place that changes the actual synaptic connections, that changes the interconnectedness between the neurons and the total number of connections that we have within the neurons within the network is what leads to the elaboration within the cerebral cortex, within the brain itself. And that's where we start seeing all of these wonderful gyruses and sulcuses, the little grooves of folds that we see within the brains of individuals where we're not getting bigger brains as we learn, but we're getting denser brains as we learn. We're getting brains that are more flexible as we learn. We're getting brains that have better connections, that have deeper sulcuses, deeper invaginations, deeper grooves, but bigger outcrops of cells within the brain itself. That, that term, that, that often idea of neuroplasticity is the response that the cells have to the fundamental principles of the use or disuse principle. That is, we're either going to be using the neurons or we're not going to be using the neurons. So based off of use or disuse, the neurons will grow or atrophy. When we use the neurons, they're going to grow. And that growth is going to lead to better interconnectedness between the neurons, denser neural areas, bigger gyruses, deeper sulcuses. Whereas when we don't use the neurons, we're going to start having atrophy taking place. That atrophy is where we start to lose the connectionness that's going to lead to a uh, reduction in the density of the tissues that's going to lead to uh, narrower and shallower sulcuses and smaller gyruses. We're not going to see as much, much ridges within the brain, as much kind of convolution within the brain that we see. So the principle that we're looking at in terms of the adaptations that are taking place within the learning process is based off of the concept of hypertrophy, use it or lose it. It's not where we're getting more cells. There, yes, we do get new neurons as we go through. That's once again, so another kind of myth and misconception about neurons is that we never get new neurons. We're constantly losing neurons. While we do constantly lose neurons, just like we lose all cells within the body, we do get new neurons. It's just that the rate at which the new neurons grow is much smaller, is much smaller and much, much slower than the rate at which we lose the neurons. And part of that has to do with the fact that we have to make sure that the connectedness that we have within the neurons remains because it's that interconnectedness that we have between the neurons that's going to ensure that we have a memory for what's taking place. All of the memories that we have are based off of how the neurons are interconnected with each other. And that interconnectedness can only be there if the neurons remain. The forgetfulness that we can get as we age has to deal with the loss of some of that interconnectedness. And so when we start looking at how we go about learning neurologically, the idea of learning comes about due to strengthening and weakening that interconnectedness and the strengthening and weakening of the interconnectedness 
leads to leads to growth or loss of growth, atrophy of the neurons that are being connected or not connected. There's a process that we have within this. There's a there's a phenomenon or a principle that that we look at that's referred to as Habian synaptic plasticity or Habian synapsing. And that is based off the idea that neurons are going to make networks of neurons. And the use or disuse of neurons within any network leads to changes within the synapses of that network. The increased use of synapses leads to strengthening of those synapses, while, de while if we decrease the use, we're going to lead to weakening of those synapses. Strengthening the synapses makes it easier to send the signal, which makes it easier to have interconnectedness, which makes it easier to remember. Weakening of the synapses makes it harder to send the signal, which makes it harder to remember the stimulus that we're interacting with or the memory we're trying to recall. This coordination leads to the better connectedness, the stronger signaling within the networks, where the more synergy that takes place between the neurons, the more signals are going to be able to be passed. And it's going to make that network stronger. Over time, the synapsing leads to the neural activity of synchrony. That is, the neurons are going to start to fire together. And so the Habian synapsing response, the Habian response that we look at when we start looking at learning, is that the neurons that are going to fire together, the neurons that are going to be in synchrony with each other, are the neurons that are going to survive together. Those synapses are going to survive together, and we can build onto those synapses. And so when we start first learning how to do stuff, the idea of first learning how to do stuff is based off of getting all of the neurons to start to fire together. If I have to learn something new after I have all of those neurons firing together, I have to relearn how to send that signaling so that the synchrony starts to become more synchronous as opposed to becoming disjuncted. It's during that disjuncted sing signaling is during the, the asynchronicity of the learning process where it can become difficult for me to remember or where I can become confused and maybe misremember some of the things I'm trying to remember. And this is where we start looking at how can we go about learning so as to maximize the learning capability of an individual? And this is where people will start talking about or discuss different types of learning strategies as an educator, where we start talking about passive learning versus active learning, group dynamic learning versus problem-based learning. All of these different scenarios, all we're doing is trying to figure out how best to get that neuronal network within the pathways that we're trying to get to synchronously fire, to synchronously fire, to sync up with each other so that we can build on to the previously learned information in such a way that we're adding tools, adding repertoire, adding memories, adding information on top of other information without causing information overload. When we start looking at that idea about information overload, what it really is discussing is it's discussing the fact that we cannot get the syncing up of the neuronal networks. We get too much disjunction taking place. And that too much disjunction taking place is going to cause psychological aversion, is going to cause psychological stress, is going to cause cognitive stress to the individual trying to remember where they have problems understanding what are they trying to recall because there's too much stuff at the same time being recalled. And this is where we take young learners versus old learners. Young learners don't have a lot of previously learned repertoire. They don't have a lot of already synchronized networks, which means that they're syncing up their networks new time. Whereas for the older learners, they already have synchronicity within their network. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to resync the networks with newer things. And this is where it can become difficult at times to learn new things once I have set up that synchronicity of fire. And it's that synchronicity of firing that's going to allow me to learn, allow me to recall in terms of either behavioral responses or in terms of cognitive responses, learning new information for a test or learning how to do something new in terms of like playing a sport, 
playing an instrument, learning how to ride a bike, doing something new that as I age, I want to try to do. It's going to take more time. It's going to take more effort than it would when I was younger, simply because the ability to get new synchronicity takes more effort, takes more time. It's not that plasticity drops as I age. It's that I have to do more plasticity in order to get the same level of learning that I would have had at a younger age. So what is this plasticity actually looking at? What is this plasticity actually measuring? What we're actually measuring is we're measuring the way in which the synapses are playing a role within the learning process in which we're going to have distinct modifications taking place at the junction points between the neurons, at the junction point between the cells within the brain that are responsible for doing all the memory, making all the emotional responses, making all of the, the behavior motor responses. The first modification that we're going to take a look at is that we're going to change how much neurotransmitters we're going to see in the neuron that needs to release the neurotransmitters. The second modification that we're going to see is we're going to see a change in the actual proteins that are holding the neurons together. And this is where we have a really bad analogy of, of what we're talking about when we talk about the synapse. A lot of people think about the synapse as having kind of like this space. And yes, there is a space, but it's not an empty space. There are proteins, there is uh, extracellular fluids. There's a whole bunch of stuff that is surrounding the membrane that's holding the two neurons in place around each other. And so it's not like neuron, the first neuron is free and floating and not actually connected, connected to the second neuron. They're held in place by proteins. Some of these proteins are sometimes referred to as connexons. And what ends up happening is that as we start to have more of those neurotransmitters getting stored in that first neuron, the neuron's going to send the neurotransmitters those connexons start to increase in the amount that happens to be within the, the synapse. The other modification that's taking place is on the second neuron, on the neuron that's going to receive the neurotransmitter. And that's where we're going to start to see more receptors for the neurotransmitter. And so the neurotransmitters, in terms of what they actually are, is simply just a chemical messenger that's going from one neuron to another neuron. And in order for a chemical messenger to have a response, it needs to have a way to trigger the second cell. And the way which it triggers the second cell is through a, a protein on the membrane known as a receptor. And that receptor has a specific binding area, a area that will allow for the chemical to attach that will cause a change in the shape of the protein that will lead to ions moving into or out of the cell. And so when we start using these synapses more often, leading into that synchronicity of firing, we're going to start seeing more neurotransmitters on the first neuron that's going to send the, send the neurotransmitter signal, more connexons holding the two neurons together and pulling them closer to each other, making the space in between the two neurons very, 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 very narrow. And we're going to start seeing more of the receptors on the second neuron within the network. This modification is going to be seen in all of the neurons within the network that are synchronized to fire together. So it's not just where we're going to see it with one neuron. We're going to see it with hundreds of neurons. The next modification we're going to see as we continue to use these, these neurons within the, within the network is we're going to start seeing a change in the density of the actual connections. We're going to start seeing more branching taking place. Within the first neuron, we're going to start seeing more splits on the axons, that's the transmitting side of the neuron, to give us more terminal ends that will correspond with the higher amount of neurotransmitters that are available. On the second neuron, the neuron that's receiving the signal, we're going to see greater branching on the membrane that's called the dendrite. That's the area of the neuron that's going to be receiving the signal. We're going to see little spines kind of prop up off the membrane to actually increase the surface area of interaction that's taking place within those, those neurons. The end result of these changes leads to an increase in speed of activation and transmission of the signal. As we start seeing more branching, as we start seeing higher densities of the synapses, a secondary change takes place within the axons. That's that, once again, that's the transmitting side of the neuron where the axons actually get bigger. 
This is where we have a secondary phenomenon that's going to come into play. And that secondary phenomenon is referred to as Henneman's size principle. And the Henneman size principle simply says that axons that are bigger send signals slightly faster than axons that are smaller. And it has to deal with how much surface area is available for the ions to move from outside to inside and from inside to outside based off of the sending of the action potential. That is the, the signal along the, the neuron that says we need to do something. So as we get these changes, we're going to see an increased speed of activation, an increased speed of transmission of the signal, a larger signal being sent, and a greater response within the network that is synchronized to fire together. So we're going to see, we're going to see greater rates of action potentials being sent. The way in which the action potentials work is that we can't get a bigger action potential in terms of the amplitude. So like the action potential doesn't get stronger, but what ends up happening is that we send more of the action potentials along as we get the greater signal taking place. Now, the exact opposite set of changes is gonna occur within the neurons that are out of synchrony within this network. And this is how we're building that memory. We're trying to synchronize all of the neurons to fire in unison so that we're able to get the correct outcome from the neuron signals. And so in those neurons that are, that are out of synchrony, we're going to have slight inhibitions taking place within those out of synchrony neurons because they're gonna be in what's referred to as refractory at the time in which other signals are hitting them, which means that they're trying to get themselves back to a set, back to a state where they're able to send another signal, but they're not ready to send another signal when the signal hits it. And this set of changes in the out of synchrony leads to the reduction in those branches, reduction in the amount of neurotransmitters at the terminal ends, reduction in the number of synapses, and it leads to less cell mass over time based off of the changing in the syncing between the neurons. It's going to lead to a retraction of the terminal branches, what we refer to as pruning of the synapses. And what we're able to do is that we're able to get the, the synaptic changes that ultimately allows for a better flow of the action potential trains, that is those, those rates of action potentials being sent, within the pathway. The modification is going to occur throughout the nervous system. If we're looking at it in terms of learning, the principal sites that we're going to see these big changes is going to be within the limbic system, within the frontal cortex of the, the brain. Within the limbic system, we're going to see big changes within the hippocampus. We're going to see big changes within the, synap within the limbic system relays that is going to lead to learning and to memory. We're going to see better functioning with, with, within the neurons that's going to allow for easier tran transitions and easier uh, exchanges of memory in between my learning my short-term memory, my functional memory, my long-term memory, my functional recall memory, resulting in better cognition and the ability to link stimuluses and situations with the desired behavior that's going to ensure that learning will occur through this increased interconnectedness that we see by reducing any type of jigger, any type of kind of asynchronous firing that might occur within that network. And this is where, once again, we have to look at the difference between the older brain and the younger brain. The older brain, we're going to have to do a lot of rewiring, a lot of having to deal with that jigger, a lot of having to deal with that asynchrony that can occur within that neural network as we're learning. And this is where adult learners, learners who are, have quote unquote older brains, we have to use that to our advantage by linking what we're teaching them with what they already know. All we're trying to do is refine something. This is where we have to use what is already known, whether it's true or not, as the foundation for what we're trying to teach or what we're trying to refine as a new thing. It's not that we have to change the method of teaching, which we'll get to later on in the talk, 
we simply have to understand that the methods by which the neurons are going to change is going to be slightly different in the older adult relative to the younger learner. And it's that that leads to the idea that the younger nervous system will have a higher capacity for plasticity than we will see with the older nervous system, which is why younger learners may have an easier time learning things than older learners will have in terms of learning things. But regardless of the type of learner or the age of the learner, what we have to do is we have to remember that in order to get that synchronicity of firing, we have to allow the learner to have time to process the information and process the information in such a way that they're able to link within their nervous system the interconnectedness of the pathways that will allow them to learn the behavior or learn the information that they're being taught within a class without overloading them with information. And this is where a lot of learners get mixed information or mixed messages where they think they have to get more and more and more and more information in order to be able to master the, the topic that they're looking at or have a high enough level of information or to have or perform at optimal levels on an, on an exam. And for a lot of them, based off of the coerciveness within the educational system, where that idea about optimal uh, performance on the exam is they get 100%. And the thing is, is we need to actually allow them to take the information they've been given through lectures, through, through handouts, through reading materials, through podcasts, through whatever means and methods they're able to get their information. We have to give them a chance and an opportunity to process out the information without giving them more information, even if the information is related to the topics that they're learning. They need time to process, and it's that processing that leads to the actual learning, and that's where you have to give time and opportunity to go through various modalities of expression, various modalities of learning, in order to allow for the synchronicity of pathways to go across various pathways that allows for the full learning to take place. This is where you have to give time and give opportunity to discuss, where you have to give time, give opportunity to refine, where you are not just sitting there in a single modality, whether that be auditory information or visual information, where you're given a chance to actually express information, where you're actually able to express behavior. And this is where a lot of students and a lot of education uh, officials, a lot of educators start getting this misconception about modalities of learning and having a specific learning type. But what's around that? There's no specific learning type. We learn across modalities. You learn across modalities from simply getting the information to processing the information to expressing the information. And we have to be able to express that information across different modalities. We have to be able to write it. We have to be able to speak it. We have to be able to act it out. We have to be able to do stuff with the information. This is where the idea about active learning comes into play as opposed to passive learning comes into play. Where just getting information is not learning. Getting information is simply getting information. The way in which we learn that information is by creating all of that interconnectedness, creating all those new networks creating the synchronicity of firing within the networks that causes stronger networks to develop that allows us to integrate new information with old information, old information with other old information in order to create an elaborate interaction of neurons within the brain. And that elaborate interconnectedness of neurons within the brain allows us to have greater cognitive ability and greater knowledge set forth where we're able to do critical thinking skills, where we're able to do application of what we're looking at, what we're seeing, what we're reading, what we're hearing, what we're doing, so that we can express our understanding of what we're at, whatever that happens to be. That expression of understanding of can, can be playing a sport, that understanding of can be playing a musical instrument, that understanding of can be taking a test that understanding of can be teaching information. It's that ability to do that understanding of that comes at the end of all of the interconnectedness changes, all the plastic changes, all the plasticity that's taking place within the neurons 
all of those changes that we see with, within the brain, within the neurons themselves, is what leads to that outward expression of knowledge, that outward expression of understanding. While some people might say, oh, I'm a visual learner. That means that I learn by, by watching. You might acquire information by watching, but you're not actually learning. And that's the difference between knowledge and learning and actual understanding of the topic. And this is why when we start looking at educational processes, we don't look at simply factual recall as being the end of the learning process. That is where we start looking at Bloom's taxonomy of learning or Dreyfus's or Dreyfus's uh, layers or stages of mastery. When we start looking at this idea about taxonomic understanding or levels of mastery, what we're really talking about is we're talking about how is it that the way in which we're able to integrate information within the brain is able to be expressed. And the way in which we look at that expression is not simply off of factual recall. The way in which we look at expression of information is based off of what's referred as application of information. And that's where we have to look at all of the modalities that we have in terms of learning and in terms of expression. So that's, that person says, oh, I'm a visual learner. I learn by watching. Or that, that person that says, oh, I learn by hearing. I'm an auditory learner. The idea about visual learning or, or auditory learning is looking at the passive reception of information. And what we're talking about is we're talking about preferred modality for sensory input. I prefer to hear things. I prefer to watch things. I prefer to read things. And when we start looking at those things as preferences for acquisition of information, it gets kind of lumped into, this is how I prefer to learn. But the way in which we learn is not by singling out one modality of information processing or of information input, the stimulus that's going to cause all of the changes along the neural pathways within the brain that's going to allow for changes within the limbic system, it's going to cause changes within the frontal cortex, it's going to cause changes within the temporal lobe, it's going to cause changes within the parietal lobe, it's going to cause changes within the cerebral cortex, cerebral cortex itself, within the brain itself, that's going to allow me to become quote unquote smarter, that's going to allow me to become more educated or more knowledgeable. The idea about this single modality item in terms of how I am best to learn is not in terms of how I want to learn, but how I want to acquire information. We all will acquire information visually. We will all acquire information auditorily. We will all acquire information kinesthetically. In order to actually express knowledge, we have to put all of those aspects together into a single output. And that's when we start talking about, am I actually gaining the information? Am I actually learning the information? Am I actually retaining the information? We talk about it in terms of a process of, okay, i received information. I now have to process out that information. I now have to repeat that information. I now have to have repetitive stimulus. And it's that repetitive stimulus. It's that constant refinement. It's that constant interaction with the knowledge base, with the stimulus that allows for the changing within the synchronicity of firing that's going to lead to the strengthening or weakening of the synapses based off of the synchronicity of firing that's going to lead to growth within the neurons particularly if we have a positive growth status that's going to allow for the strengthening of the neural networks that's going to allow for knowledge acquisition and learning, regardless of the age of the individual and the ability for having plasticity to take place, regardless of the person being uh, neurodivergent or neuroatypical versus someone who is neurotypical. It doesn't matter in terms of all of the, those factors. The, per, the person with neurodivergence, the person that has neuroatypical issues, may have to deal with other factors within that synchronicity of firing that may have to do some sort of behavioral modification to ensure that we have proper synch synchronicity of firing, proper sequencing within the neural networks to make sure that learning is taking place correctly. They may have to expend more energy to do so, but they're still able to do the exact same thing. That's where we start looking at types of adaptations that we can do, types of accommodations that we can do to the learning environment to allow for 
minimization of the other things that the neurodivergent or the neuroatypical person has to deal with so they can focus on what is of importance within the learning process, within refining those neural networks to allow for proper, proper knowledge acquisition and proper knowledge application. And it's that application that is the indication of learning. It's the application that is the indication of knowledge. And this is where we have to put into the visual, the auditory, the kinesthetic models of learning together. And this is where we get the passive learning environment versus the active learning environment. The passive learning environment is predominantly reliant upon that auditory and that visual information stimulus being processed as a form of learning, where the individual is just simply passively obtaining the information. There's no true interactions. There's no laying down of the various neural networks. There's no refining the neural networks. There's no increasing the synchronicity of information being passed within the nervous system. All we're doing in, in this environment is simply passively getting exposed to the stimulus. The, in order to further that learning, in order to refine that learning, we have to use secondary modalities. We have to utilize other things. We have to do kinesthetic things. We have to take notes. We have to write down what we're doing. We have to repeat information. We have to see in here and then we have to repeat the information. And doing that acting, that, that repeating, that miming, that, that aping of what we're seeing is where we're getting that learning taking place. And it can only take place through active participation within that whole learning environment. And this is where if I, as an educator, am going to be utilizing a passive learning environment, I'm going to have to give some sort of cueing to the students in order to have them actively engage with the information so that they're able to do that secondary processing in order to lay down the networks. It doesn't mean I have to give them additional lecture. It doesn't mean I have to give them additional information. It means that I have to give them cues in order to help them with the retrieval, with the development of the neural networks. And this is why utilizing study guides, if I'm utilizing a passive learning outcome, is going to have to come into play. I have to give review questions so that the students have a chance to process out the information that they are simply passively interacting with, which is much different than if we happen to have an active learning environment within the, the classrooms, within the, the learning atmospheres, where I'm able to utilize all of the various learning modalities the auditory learning modality, the, the visual learning modality, the kinesthetic learning modality, so that they're able to integrate all of the various senses that they have so that they can integrate the information with the senses within the neural relay networks to strengthen the neural relay networks so that they're able to apply what is being presented to them, even if they are simply passively accepting the information either auditorily or visually. But if I ignore that and simply have just this passive reception of information where I'm not allowing for those secondary pathways to come in, where I'm strictly looking at that passive acquisition of information, when I'm looking at that as being the sole component of learning, there is no true activity taking place that's going to allow for secondary pathways to get synced. And because I don't have secondary pathways getting synced, the strength of the total neural network is less than. And this is why the idea about incorporating active learning can become better in terms of overall performance, in terms of knowledge acquisition, in terms of, in terms of application of the knowledge at later points in time in terms of what's usually referred to as long-term retention. As long as the active learning environment is established in such a way to ensure that the proper activity in the proper learning environment is available so that we get the correct sequence, sequencing and the correct synchronicity between disjuncted pathways so that the person learning can have maximal capacity and can optimize the total learning that can take place. So we don't really have visual learners. We don't really have auditory learners. That's just simply a preference for how they, uh, 
acquire the information that is necessary for them to learn. Put quotes around the learn. It is through kinesthetic movement. It's through talking, through writing, through doing artistic expression, through movement that we're able to actually have secondary pathways get integrated into the learning pathways that makes the pathway stronger, that allows the pathway to become more integrated into the neural networks, that allows for us to have that good, uh, dense, strong synaptic network that leads to a better overall uh, performance within the brain, that leads to a more knowledgeable person, that leads to a more learned individual that leads to better recall, that leads to less forgetfulness. Now, the idea about recall and forgetfulness has other components within it, particularly as it relates to stress and anxiety within the, the uh, Soleil's gas response and the idea about uh, sympathetic uh, input and the stress that sympathetic input puts on the individual that reduces the attention that one has to the tasks and can impact a hippocampus and amygdala firing that will impact the ability to recall. The other thing we have to look at in terms of this neural networking and learning and the ability to process that information is to make sure that the amount of information is not overwhelming the individual. And this is one of the big changes that has kind of taken place within a lot of the education of, uh, philosophies more recently is the idea of allowing problem solving to become the central point of the learning, where you have active learning, not by taking information and then applying the information, but, uh, but attempting to apply information without having the, the knowledge base to be an expert or to have any level of even novice level of understanding of what's going on where you're actively problem solving out, where you're actively attempting to, to create a solution to something based off of having a guise of what might be true, where the, the educator, where the, the instructor is really a guide within the pathway of learning, but the student is the one that is actively engaged with the learning. This is where you are learning how to learn. And that goes back into this idea about establishing those neural networks. Because if I'm, if I'm learning how to learn, I'm learning how to problem solve, if I'm learning how to problem solve, I can make logical assumptions about information even if I don't have all of the information and all of the understanding that's necessary in order to be an expert in the topic or in the subject. I know enough about how to process out information. I know enough about how to logically get through the, the thinking processes where I have a base of knowledge and I can apply that base of knowledge to various scenarios based off of what is being asked of me in terms of the application where I use my application, where I use the, the critical thinking and the problem-based uh, solving of learning, to learn more about the specific concept or the, or the specific topic that the instructor is trying to teach me about. And what this does is this works into the way in which the brain kind of actually works in terms of learning and in terms of forming those neural networks, trial and error. And that trial and error is uh, attempting to set up a cause and effect relationship between stimulus and response. A lot of times that, that need to have a causal relationship can lead us astray in terms of associating responses as being a cause and effect when it's really just an association of responses, a correlation. And that's where we have this, this idea that, or this, this saying that correlation is not causation and causation is not correlation. They're two separate things. Correlations are simply just things that are associated with each other, whereas causation is we see a direct linkage of when this happens, this other thing is going to result. And when we start having the ability to link up this cause and effect uh, relationship within our brain as we're learning that information, those neural networks become even stronger because we have tied into this neural network of learning a cognitive emotional response to what's going on. 
whether that cognitive emotional response is of reward is a whole other story. We're always seeking that re- we're always seeking that reward in terms of the, the learning environment. And sometimes the reward is I don't want to get an answer wrong. And that's one of those ideas about the, the coerciveness within the educational process where the students feel like they should not be offering up any type of ideas if the idea can be seen as wrong or as incorrect, where there's going to be some sort of embarrassment if they happen to get something incorrect without understanding that you actually learn through the mistakes that you're making and the corrective feedback that is given so that you're able to, once again, rewire the neural networks so that you can have the correct synchronicity of firing so you can eliminate the incorrect jitter or jigger within the, the, the neural networks so that you're able to have the correct outcome, the correct output with the correct amount of growth within the neurons, with the correct synaptic growth, with the correct synaptic plasticity taking place so that at the end of the the learning process, the correct information is the correct information and you're able to process the correct information in such a way that it becomes an an application of something else, not simply just a rote regurgitation of factual information, not just recall of information. Recall of information is important at a base level. However, in order to actually show knowledge and understanding of a topic, you have to be able to have the application to that information. And that application to the information can be being able to argue both sides of a, uh, of a debate topic, being able to process out and develop something new to synthesize a new idea, to synthesize a conclusion, to infer a conclusion based off of proper inductive reasoning, to deductively develop a hypothesis to explain some sort of phenomena that you're seeing based off of things that you, that you have a base knowledge about or that you have a, a gist of understanding, where understanding that the hypothesis is n- nothing that's ever right or wrong. It's simply just the, the explanation I have prior to actually running any type of actual true experiment on, what, on the phenomenon that, that I'm making the hypothesis on. Where using the knowledge that, that we're gathering, using, using the critical thinking skills, using that, that growth within the neural networks, using the hippocampus and the, and the frontal cortex, and all of the various limbic system pathways to develop the correct reward response, what we're able to do is we're able to generate pathways within the nervous system that causes rewards to take place for acquisition of information and the application of that information in such a way that we're able to express our knowledge. And it all boils down back to what's happening at the neurons and how those neurons are changing based on use and disuse. It's the same thing that is going to extend from the, the cerebral cortex, from the brain itself, down through the spinal cord and out to the, into, the nervous, into the nerves that run throughout our body. As we learn new behaviors, the ability to have neurons within the spinal cord change the connection points that they have, the amount of connection points, the density of connection points, the strength of those connection points, to allow for the, the neurons that make up the nerves of the body to undergo hypertrophication, undergo, undergo growth based off of being used more and more and more and more. That leads to an, an ease of application, an ease of expression. This is where we are able to learn skills, not just learn knowledge. And the ability to learn skills comes through the same type of pathways Except that instead of looking at in terms of pathways of learning and memory, we're also looking at in terms of pathways of motor execution. That is the ability to do the movements where we're going to get changes within the the areas of the brain that are responsible for causing movements of the body. But we're also going to get changes within the spinal cord and changes within the peripheral nerves that are going to allow us to move with greater ease, to have better efficiency of movement. And that's the real thing we're looking at in terms of the, the learning in terms of the ability to have these neural changes is we're making the nervous system more efficient. A 
more efficient brain, a more efficient spinal cord, a more efficient nervous system at, in whole makes the person smarter. It's not about the size of the brain. Once again, that's a whole other myth and misconception in terms of uh, big brain, small brain individuals and the level of intelligence that, that that person has. It's about efficiency within the nervous system, about efficiency of connections, about about having a strong and uh, steady neural networks that allow for proper execution of the learned behaviors in the correct scenarios based off the stimuluses that are being presented. And so when we, when we look at all of these, these aspects of learning, look at all these aspects of neural anatomy, all these aspects of neural physiology as it relates to, to learning, it's all about generating stronger connections between the neurons and by generating stronger connections between the neurons, we're able to, to generate more efficient neurons. And we're able to, gener to generate more efficient neural networks. The problem with this is, is that as we age, the strength of those neural networks starts to degrade. And they start to degrade based off of, once again, use and disuse. The more often I'm using those neural networks, the stronger those neural networks become. Which is why when people start having experiences of dementia, people start having experiences of memory lapses. The memories that are hardwired to the point where the instantaneous recall are the ones that they do not lose. And that's because those, those networks are so strong that it takes a very, very, very long time for them to weaken to the point where they're lost. However, the memories that aren't always being recalled, the memories that aren't always being used are the ones that are lost because those synapses become weak, because those networks start to become disjuncted. They start to fire asynchronously. They, start, they stop being part of this, the, the synchronicity of neural activation. We start to lose those, those memories, start losing that ability to do whatever skill we're looking at. And that happens with age based off of, am I using those networks or not? And a lot of uh, people start thinking about, well, then I must need to do more cognitive and uh, thinking stuff, more critical thinking stuff in order to keep the, those neurons around to keep those memories nice and strong. Yes, that's true. You do have to be cognitively aware of stuff going on in order to keep those neurons around. But what you have to do is you have to establish a pro-growth establishment within the body. That means you have to be physically active. You have to be producing a number of various types of growth hormones, such as brain-derived neural growth factors, such as general neural growth factors, such as growth hormones, such as insulin-like growth factors, such as having a proper and appropriate responses to, to insulin so that you're able to have the appropriate neural growths that are taking place in order to keep those synapses that had grown strong remaining strong. Stuff that we have talked about when we, when we looked at how exercise and activity is going to be important in terms of your, your overall uh, cognitive health and in terms of your overall uh, behavioral applications in terms of your overall level of memory and uh, information retention. But we've also discussed this in terms of the idea about metabolic issues and inflammation and uh, what now some people refer to as type 3 diabetes, which is related to metabolic issues and dementia somewhere along the Alzheimer's-like pathway in terms of the, the dementia issues. But it's really just about how inflammation and how inactivity leads to oxidative stress, and then oxidative stress leads to a reduction in the neural firing pathways. And when we reduce those neural firing pathways, we end up losing some of those neurons within the pathway, within the network, that can impact my ability to remember, my ability to recall, my ability to have good cognition. Well, thanks for listening. Hope we got a little bit out of the discussion as it relates to how changes in the neurons will help us with learning, how the various types of uh, Learning styles aren't really true because we're going to use all of the various styles out there. We'll get a little more into that when we start, when we can discuss, or we will discuss specific uh, learning behaviors and how the, the visual learner is not really a visual learner and how the auditory learner is not really an auditory learner in a different talk. But once again, hopefully you got a little bit out of this discussion here. Please make sure you're following us on the podcast as well as on YouTube, the written stuff and stuff stack, as well as the quick takes on Instagram and on threads. Make sure you give us that big five-star rating, big thumbs up to tell us that you are enjoying what we're putting out there. Share it with all your friends and family. 
Please stay tuned for further discussions as it relates to all of the various aspects of human physiology, human health, and the myths and misconceptions that we have to deal with.